Uh, okay, uh, welcome everyone to the latest installment in this is lecture and film series, focusing of course on Luis Buño, a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, uh, following his oeuvre uh, over the course of the last, by now, eight or nine months. Uh, we're coming towards the end of the series. Uh, we will have two more uh, screenings with lectures uh, after this one. Uh, Tristana in three weeks time with Hordi Schiffer introducing the film and then last of all the very last film in Buñuel's oeuvre uh, that obscure object of desire presented by Anno Dupra uh, on the 29th of January uh, 29th of June to round out very on a very appropriate note round out uh, the series today we will be looking at the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie and we have Marie Rebecki uh, guiding us through the film and guiding us through uh, particular elements of the film which she will be uh, discussing. Uh, Marie teaches uh, or lectures at the Université Ex Marseille in uh, the history and aesthetics of cinema. She has been active as both a scholar and also as a curator, organizing uh, exhibitions focusing on uh, modernist cinema in various ways. And she has also published the fascinating monograph, uh, Paris 1929. Eisenstein, Bataille, and Buñuel, looking at this particular historical juncture at the end of the 1920s in Paris, where we have three titanic figures of uh, modern art in general, kind of encountering each other in the same space. Uh, for her lecture tonight, though, she'll be zooming forward uh, to the 1970s uh, with her lecture, Film Surrealiste, The Indiscreet Charm of Disgust. So please join me in welcoming Marie Rebecki to the lectern. So, vielen Dank, Daniel Firefox und das Filmmuseum, Filminstitut, für uh, die Einladung. I can't speak German, so I shift to English. <laughs> okay, so tonight I have the honor of introducing Buñuel's masterpiece, The Charm Discreet de la... Le Charme Discreet de la Bourgeoisie, The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie. Uh, as you know, there are countless ways to analyze, criticize, and present this film. I've chosen as a key to open and traverse the surrealist universe of this film, extensively studied by film studies specialists, Buñuel's relationship to food and to social political significance of food itself. In Buñuel's filmography, the relation between uh, disgust, perversion, and food, particularly social meaning and ritual of food, begin to appear from 60s when the director shot Viridiana, 1961. In this film, it was the iconographic structure of Leonardo's Last Supper that was completely perverted. In the 60s and the 70s, the themes of disgust, excess, perversion, and pleasure, taken to fatal extremes, become increasingly frequent in European cinema. Like Bertolucci's Last Tango in Paris 1972 and Marco Ferreri, La Grande Buffata, La Grande Bouffe, 1963, Buñuel's The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie 1972, the film scheduled tonight, sublimates, perverts, and replaces the occurrence of the event itself, the dinner or lunch party. In Buñuel's filmography, the relations between disgust, perversion, and above all, sublimation of the act of eating and the impossibility of having dinner or lunch together is, as just said, begin to appear insistently from 60 in various forms. But it's important to remember that is already present in different ways in Buñuel's films of the first surrealist vague of the late 20s. I will therefore present a brief look at Buñuel's relationship with food and the act of eating a relationship that in his film from the late 20s and then again from the early 60s comes in different forms. 
erotic, excessive, dramatic, perverse, missed, until his disappearance in the film that is our obscure object of desire, of viewing of desire of this evening. The third film in which this attitude of Brunuel's uh, disgust and perversion is manifested in L'Age d'Or, 1930. In Bunuel surrealist cinema of the late 20s, the relation with food and eating is expressed almost exclusively in sublimated ways, in the erotic and perverse dimension of desire. The act of eating is present in modes of intensive figuration of sex, for example, through a series of explicit replacement images. This mechanism is employed in some famous sequences of L'Age d'Or, 1930, <coughs> among them the macro sequence depicting the two lovers in the garden, you can see here, where the erotic desire of the man and the woman find an outlet in perverse cannibalistic instincts. We see the actress Lialis, who, after sucking her lover's fingers, bites his hand, mutilating it with sadistic gusto. Eros is bound up with a disagreeable, a disagreeable dimension represented on a particular plane of ambiguity and polysemy. The other sequence The other sequence that enables us to observe this replacement mechanism is clearly the one where Lia Lis sucks the big toe of a statue. An obvious fetish that Freudian symbolism tends to connect with the phallus. The idea of eroticism suggested by the scene as a sacrificial violation appropriation of the other is perfectly aligned with some of the ideas underlying Georges Bataille's theory of errors. In two texts published in 1929 and 1930 in the journal Document, respectively, respectively entitled Le Gros Orteil, The Big Toe, and Bouche, Mouth, one can already find a possible interpretation of the scene, uh, of the Ash d'Or scene that we saw uh, some images. So, in particular, the photograph by Jacques André Boiffard, accompanying George Bataille's two texts, The Magnification of Two Toes and the Gaping and a Gaping Mouth, that you can see here to highlight two fundamental aspects that the erotic sequence in the garden in the Lash d'Or evokes explicitly. The attraction to one of the most disgusting parts of the human body, or the big toe, and the desire to orally satisfy this drive by opening the mouth wide, the better to taste and devour the object of this the same, the same desire. So according to Bataille, the most elementary aspect of appropriation is always presented in the form of oral consumption, considered as a communion, participation, identification, incorporation or assimilation. In this sense, the mouth is described by Bataille as a prowl of animals, downgraded to an organ capable of liberating men's and women's impulses. In the same way, the eye, l'œil, the eye, the subject of the entry œil in the critical dictionary of the journal Document, journal um, was written by uh, this entry by Desnos, Bataille and Griol, is definitely not described as the highest and noblest organ of the human body, the eye. Through Bataille's cannibal gates, the eye becomes an edible object, downgraded to a friandise cannibale, a cannibal delicacy. In Bataille's article, the eye significantly evokes two cinematic 
images. The first is the famous last eye in the prologue to Buñuel and Dali's Ancien Andalou, 1929. These images, it was not published in the review in the journal, but suggested in a note to the article. And the other, that you can see on uh, your right, published in the body of the text, represent the eyes of John Crawford in a state of ecstasy, beside herself, bulging, our, uh, bulging out of their sockets. Buñuel eyes becomes a true friandise cannibal, being concretely turned into a boiled egg dissected by the blade of a knife in the film by Roger Barlow, Harry Hay and Leroy Robbins, even as you and I, 1937. The sequences, parading Ancien Andalou, are set in a broader framework. Three authors decide to participate in a contest for amateur movie makers, but are unable to think up ideas for a screenplay. Even as you and I, retrieves and reproduces some avant-garde motifs, ironically perverting and downgrading them through a series of mocking references to food. The eyeball, sadistically dissected by a razor blade in Ancien Andalou, is first evoked by a light bulb lying in a frying pan, you can see here, <coughs> then by a razor slicing into the white of a narboiled egg. Shortly after the release of A Chien d'Alou and L'Age d'Or in the fall of 1930, Buñuel was invited by a representative of Metro Golden Mayer to stay six months in the United States to learn some good American technical skills and learn how to make a movie, as Buñuel states in its autobiography. After the American experience in April 1931, Buñuel decided to return to Madrid and undertook the considerable feat of making the documentary La Sordes Tierra Sin Pan about uh, the desolate land without bread in the Extremadura, only a few hours from the metropolitan life of Madrid. With this documentary of denunciation, Buñuel concretely explored excess and scarcity in relation to food. Excess appear in the violence with which he depicted the destitution of the population of Las Urdes, while scarcity is directly connected with the hunger and scarcity of food evoked by the title of the documentary. The images of food, shortages, poverty, disease, death, degradation, the deformation of the earth and the inhabitants of Las Urdes, shown through a visual concert set to the notes of Brahms' Symphony No. 4 overwhelmed the anguished viewer aware of his own helplessness. So, in the 60s, as I mentioned earlier, after a long Mexican interlude, in Buñuel's filmography, the relations between perversion and social religious meaning of food begin to appear increasingly from 60s, when the director showed Viridiana. Here, as I said, uh, as I just said, he was the iconographic structure of Leonardo's Last Supper that was completely perverted. Buñuel repeated the arrangement of the apostles, but replaced them with a group of irate beggars, the sick and the lepers. In the 70s, the terms of disgust, excess, perversion and pleasure in relation to food become, frequently, uh, become frequent in the films. Uh, on this occasion, we especially remember films shot in Europe to observe the proximity with uh, Buñuel. Example of this imagery of uh, abandonment 
appear in Bernardo Bertolucci's Ultimo Tango a Parigi, Last Tango in Paris, 1972, in which Marlon Brando eats seated on the floor before performing the violent act of sodomy with butter on Maria Schneider, today condemnable, but um, this uh, is one of the most uh, significant scenes about this violence um, through uh, food, uh, shown by the food. So uh, many of these themes recur with the same black humor and aesthetic disinhibition in Marco Ferreri's La Grande Abuffata, La Grande Bouffe, 1973. You see a photogram here. Described by Buñuel himself as a monument to hedonism and a tragedy of the flesh. The four characters in the film, the magistrate Philippe Noiret, the television director Michel Piccoli, the cook and the pilot Marcello Mastroianni, embody for different modes of bourgeois existence, emblems of bogus social organization, which they reject by staging an intolerable tragedy of flesh, whose most worthy epilogue can only be to eat until they die. The death of the four friends, united for a whole weekend in a decadent neoclassical villa outside Paris, is therefore a collective suicide by excessive enjoyment. At the eye of taste, and is a necessary dialectical reversal, it can only lead to extreme disgust and the annulment of all the senses in death. Buñuel's films from this period fit perfectly into this early 60s and 70s vague. Uh, Les Fantômes de la Liberté, The Phantom of Liberty, 1974, in which the characters socialize in the act of defecating seven bourgeois seven bourgeois friends talk around a table with pants and underwear down, sitting on water closet, while lunch is consumed in secured closed. In this case, it is the inversion of the spaces, dining room, toilet, and the act of collective defecation that Renewal reveals the cracks and unmasks the hypocrisy of bourgeois social rituals. The discreet charm of the bourgeoisie, the charme discret de la bourgeoisie, in this film, the dinner never takes place. Buñuel's The discreet charm sublimates and replays the occurrence of the event itself. The dinner planned by the six characters, <coughs> François and Simone Thévenon, François Colligue, Don Rafael Acosta, the ambassador from the South American nation of Miranda, Simon's sister, Florence, and the Seneschals, Alice and Henri. Is constantly, this dinner is constantly postponed by a series of blunders, absurd reasons, friends for the murder, the arrival of a group of army officers, who joined the dinner only to be called away for close military maneuvers, the revelation that a colonel's dining room is a stage set in a theatrical performance, so everyone was dreaming, because life isn't real and actually a play, the arrest and release of the bourgeoise France, and their summary execution by the terrorists. So absurd reasons, while also constantly evoked through the discussion of various dishes and drinks that are to be consumed. Like the unforgettable comments on how to make a dry martini or on drinking red wine with fish, and an absurd repetition compulsion that holds together a group of perverse and corrupt bourgeois. In this, in this regard, I would like to remind how Buñuel recalls in his relationship with food in his autobiography. Sorry. My last breath, mon dernier soupir. 
I would like to quote the very passage where he mentions our film, the charm, uh, discre uh, dis the discreet charm uh, of the bourgeoisie. Uh, I quote, when I finished work on Tristana, I returned to Sibelmar's fold, rediscovering Paris, my old Montparnasse hangouts, the hotel Leglon, where my windows overlooked the cemetery, my early lunches at La Cupole or La Palette or the Closerie de Lila, my daily walks and my solitary evenings. One day, when Silberman and I were talking about uncanny repetitions, he told me a story about the time he had invited some people for dinner but had forgotten to tell his wife. In fact, he forgot that he had been invited out to dinner himself the same evening. When the guests arrived, Silberman wasn't there. His wife was a weaver, but in her bathrobe. And since she had no idea anyone was coming, she had already eaten and was about to go to bed. This incident became, became the opening scene in the discreet charm of bourgeoisie. And from there, we repeated the pattern, inventing all sorts uh, of situations where a group of friends keeps trying to have dinner together but can't seem to manage it. I was long, it was long, hard work, particularly because it was crucial to maintain a sufficient degree of realism in the midst of this delirium. The script went through five different versions. While we tried to combine realism, the situation had to be familiar and developed logically, and the accumulation of strange but not fantastical obstacles. Once again, dreams helped. And then it's very important uh, for the, uh, in, the, in the film for the, yeah, intro, to introduce the, the film, this, uh, uh, this passage, when Buñuel uh, states, particularly the notion of a dream within a dream. I must confess, I must confess too, how happy I was to be able to include my personal recipe for the dry martini. In this passage, Buñuel recalls the film Incipit. It is immediately clear that Buñuel detects in the collective ritual of eating together a lens for looking closely at the specific social milieu. Many studies, as we know from social anthropology, focus on this, aspe this aspect of social bonding. Among them, there is, uh, I quote, uh, Mary Douglas Food in the Social Order, where Douglas proposes a cross-cultural study of the moral and social meaning of food. The dinner ritual, in the sense, is a tool to first and foremost <coughs> emphasize social and class inequalities and reinforce a group identity. In the opening sequence, once uh, the four bourgeois guests arrive at the Seneschal's Alice Seneschal, is surprised to see them and explains that she expected them the following evening and has no dinner prepared. The would-be guests then invite Alice to join them for a dinner at nearby restaurant L'Auberge. As Cristina Bragaglia points out in a text devoted precisely to the film's incipit, in the scene at the Auberge, the, the restaurant, the characters immediately refer to what they would like to eat. Caviar, champagne, lobster, all food of haute cuisine. A scene that immediately demonstrates the possession of economic and social capital of our six discreet bourgeois expressed from their sense of taste. Food here is a clear signal of identity. So, <laughs> What do the nine missed meals, dinner party, lunch party, we see in the film signify? Perhaps precisely a loss of bourgeois identity, not so much economically or socially, but rather precisely in terms of taste. Perhaps Buñuel, in condemning the pettiness and corruption of the bourgeoisie of the time, also anticipates the drift 
and transformation of bourgeois taste toward the worst. This loss of identity is underscored precisely by the fact that dinners are continually postponed and the moment of social bonding is deferred throughout the film, from discreet and corrupt to shameless and indiscreet exhibitionist of taste for excess. Luckily, Bonuel did not live through the 90s. I will dwell for a moment on the adjective discreet of the title. In another passage of his autobiography, Bunuel recalls the genesis of the film's title. I quote this very important passage. In my search for titles, I've always tried to follow the old surrealist trick of finding a totally unexpected word or group of words which opens up a new perspective on painting or book, on a painting or a book. This strategy is obvious in titles like Ancien Andalou, L'Age d'Or, and even in the L'Ange Exterminateur, The Exterminating Angel. While we were working on the screenplay, however, we never once thought about the word bourgeoisie. On the last day at the Parador in Toledo, the day the, day the girl died, we were desperate. I came up with a Balienine, La Vierge de l'Ecurie, down with Lenin, the Virgin of the Manager. Finally, someone suggested the charm de la bourgeoisie, the charme de la bourgeoisie. But Carrière point out that we needed an adjective. So after sifting through what seemed like thousands of them, we finally stumbled upon discreet. Suddenly the film took on a different shape altogether and even a different point of view. It was, truly, it was truly a marvelous discovery. So, what then is the meaning of discreet? In this absence, in this postponement of the dinner event, there is a form of bizarre sobriety, of discretion, discretion over excess, compared with the opulent consumer society shown for example, in the Grande Abuffata, the Grand Bouffe, uh, Marco Ferreri, sort of, yeah, consumerist, um, opulent consumer society luxury that characterized the desire, including food, of these bourgeois. Perhaps the bourgeoisie, this kind of upper and corrupt bourgeoisie, is slowly losing his power to be reincarnated in an even worse form than that described by Buñuel in his film. I would like to return quickly to another key element evoked in the passage in his autobiography in which Buñuel describes the film Incipit. Um, I quote again, once again, dreams helped, particularly the notion of dream within a dream. This expression refers to a double dream that is at the heart of the film, the charm discreet, dis uh, the charm discreet, the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie, in which constitutes a dizzying mise en abîme of the representation of the dinner that will never take place. Two dreams follow each other in the film, or rather, one dream that contains another. One character, François Thévenon, first dreams the dream of another character, Henri Sénéchal, and then his own. The sequence is about a double missed dinner party accompanied by two awakenings. It is first about the dinner at the colonel's house on Rue du Parc, Rue du Parc, which is one of the few landmarks in the film. Indeed, in the script, Buñuel and Jean-Luc Carrière state that, I quote, the action of the film take place in an important and indeterminate city in the Western world, current era. Every detail that might allow the identification of a place or an action will be eliminated, such as the uniforms of the military or the plates of a car, of cars. 
The action takes place over the course of two weeks. End of quotation. This desire of indeterminacy also is also present in The Exterminated Angel, another film about the impasse of the bourgeoisie. Everything indicates that we are, in this film, in Exterminating the Angel, that we are in a Latin American city, but nothing indicates it exactly. Indeterminacy that reinforces the universal character, hypocritical discretion of the bourgeois class of the time. Indeterminacy that we can find in a recurring scene throughout the film of the six people walking silently. I can show you here. That we can find recurring scene throughout the film, these six people walking silently on a long, isolated country road. This is also the final sequence. So, back to the double dream. The first dream, that of François Thévenot dreaming Henri Sénéchal, it's better to, yeah, to show because this is the, the double dream, the scene of the double dream. So, the first dream, that of François Thévenot dreaming Henri Sénéchal's dream, as I said, takes place in the colonel's house. The guests, seated at the table, realize that they are on a stage. Later, we see Henri Sénéchal waking up from a nightmare and telling Alice, his wife, an absurd dream, an, uh, a rêve absurd, he said. We were going to dinner at the colonel's and we were on the stage. As Tonino Repetto in his book devoted to Buñuel and the Unconscious observes, this reference to the theatre and the dreams reveals, on the one hand, the dimension of ritual and acted representation of the bourgeois society. On the other hand, this dream macro sequence questions the realistic status of all missed dinners. It is as if the dreams of two protagonists corroborate the hypothesis that all the missed dreamers are the, are the fruit of dreams made by the various characters. The last missed dinner could even be the result of a dream in Raphael's dream, who is saved uh, from the terrorist gang. It's the last, last uh, sequence. <laughs> So, uh, according to, Deleuze, to, to Gilles Deleuze, in a passage from the movement image, uh, in which he refers to Raymond Roussel and Buñuel, uh, the repetition, this fundamental element uh, that recurs in, uh, in, uh, in our film, the, charm discreet, the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie, the repetition is exactly what makes the event, the event, sorry, fail. Uh, I quote this very important passage uh, from the movement image from Deleuze. It moves from indefinite repetition to repetition as decisive instant, from a closed repetition to an open repetition, from a repetition which only fails, but induces failure to a repetition which not only succeeds, but recreates the model or the originary. And uh, at the end, uh, uh, Deleuze uh, uh, states, it is the which makes the event fail, as in the discrete charm of the bourgeoisie, where the repetition of lunch pursues its work of degradation through all the milieu which is closes on to themselves, church, army, diplomacy. So there is no purpose in these actions and in particular the only things that they appear be doing, walking and looking, as you can see here, walking, walking and looking, are emphasized precisely by their lack of logic, diegetic motivation. The mobilization of the gays is a joke. Buñuel's pseudo flaneur, in a, in a way, uh, particularly in this walking scene, 
are closer to what Deleuze has termed the spiritual automation. Rather the agents of mobile, mobile gates, they are functions of a universal, aberrant mobility, conforming to Deleuze's conception of the time image. There is a form of crystallization of time in this repetition, in this scene that show uh, a repetition that fail, fail again. So there is a form of crystallization of time repeating itself again and again, failing better and better. So, in conclusion, the repeated failure of the dinner earned to Buñuel a great reward, as you know, a win at the Oscars. It won the Academy Award for the best foreign language film. So I want to mention another anecdote told by Buñuel in his autobiography about the fate of his film, precisely about the Oscar awarded to the film. So Buñuel uh, wrote uh, in his book, a year later, when the film had been nominated for an Oscar, four Mexican reporters tracked us down El Paular, where we were already at work on another project. During lunch, they asked if I thought I was going to win that Oscar. Of course, I replied between bites. I've already paid the $25,000 they wanted. Americans may have their weakness, but they do keep their promises. A few days later, headlines in Mexico City announced that I bought the Oscar. Los Angeles was scandalized. Silberman's Uh, the producer, uh, flew over in a rage from Paris. I assured him it was all a joke, but it took quite a while for the dust to settle. Ironically, the film did win an Oscar three weeks later, and uh, in the French version, uh, Buñuel adds, and the Americans do keep their promises. <laughs> so enjoy watching the film. Let's welcome back Marie Rebecca uh, to the floor. Um, open for questions. Uh, we have a roving mic uh, for oh. questions from the audience, but I'll just kick things yeah. off. Um, what's interesting about the film, there seems to be a kind of Russian doll structure to the film in terms of the dreams. Mm -hmm. uh, it's already indicated uh, midway through the film with the kind of dream within the dream in, in a sense. Uh, and then right at the end, when Fernando Ray's character, mm -hmm. uh, the ambassador, wakes up, that's the dream that he wakes up from. It could just be the scene we've just seen, mm -hmm. or it could be the entire film we've seen. <laughs> As my <laughs> hypothesis is uh, the whole film uh, is a dream. Uh, like the, the last sequence, the last scene, uh, when uh, the Acosta dreams the mm -hmm. the terrorist comes in the seneschal's apartment house and then it may be the explanation of all the films that a uh, dream in a dream in a dream and then uh, every uh, sequence actions is played uh, like in a theater uh, like the yeah i think it's yes it's my hypothesis but uh Yeah, I don't know. Maybe comments from the the audience. So, well, what do you think? Because as uh, Buñuel, uh, I think opens this possibility uh, in the in reading the film. But uh, yeah, <laughs> there is a there was a there was a for me yes yes yeah. <laughs> even if uh, but maybe the the figure the element of the ghost is present uh, in the in the film in two different episodes uh the the officers that tells uh his story about her mother and the mother's ghost comes to visit him and so f i think there's another element that testify the the presence of some uh 
something like a dream. And the other very important thing is that um, the, um, the scene um, acted out in the theater, uh, if you if you remember, uh, the, the actors, the characters played the Don Juan. Mm? Is the so uh, in Don Juan there is the convitato di pietra, no? this uh, ghost, uh, stone ghost, the uh, stone guest. Sorry, uh, so another ghost uh, that you appears in the in the film. Then this sort of mise en beam, the theater in the theater, the ghost in the ghost, uh, the guest become a ghost. <laughs> I think yes, uh, attest or testify this sort of uh, destructor of the dreams uh, in a dream, in a dream. <laughs> yeah, there was this um, blink and you miss it moment in the film, mm -hmm. uh, but it kind of, uh, I thought it was very interesting that um, when uh, when Acosta, the, yeah, the Acosta, ambassador, yeah. uh, Oh, Miranda, yeah. Uh, when, yep, uh, when he catches the young terrorist woman yeah. uh, in his apartment and he empties her bag. Yeah. And he's like, is. lettuce and this and that. And then this is a baguette. La clé de, de, de songe. La clé de songe. <laughs> the key to dreams. Yeah. And, like, yeah. there's nothing made of that. It just is yeah, like yeah. one of another thing, of these, another random object yeah. in her bag. And yet somehow uh, that uh, seems to be very strategically placed. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting because it's a sort of a surrealist montage in uh, her bag because there is mm -hmm. something very concrete there is a baguette a salad a cabbage yeah. yeah and then the 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 clé de songe the i don't know in english is w w they translated how the key of dreams yeah key, the key dreams to, key, the key yeah, to your yeah, dreams yeah. i don't know <laughs> so it's very yeah i think uh, what we can uh, name uh, the surrealist montage of different heterogeneous elements then uh, yeah 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 but that's uh, also uh, what he never really gives us he never gives us mm -hmm. the 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 actual key the actu yeah, that yeah. could uh, unlock the dreams or yeah, unlock yeah. the meaning of uh the dream sequences it's, i or, think it's or very give us a kind of final it's very ironically because he shows a key <laughs> a big key but there is no key to interpret or to uh, to find a solution uh, a real solution of this enigma of uh, charme discret Donc i think it's very very ironical because this is the key but you can open this film in some way <laughs> i don't know but uh, i think it's my my yeah mm. suggestion uh questions or comments from the audience yes Yes, Marie, thanks very much for your lecture. Um, Savoy Cizek, in his Perfect Guide to Cinema, said that Hollywood tells us how we should desire. Yeah. And I think filmmaking is a lot about forming mm -hmm. our wishes, our desires. Yeah. And we can say, and you were hinting at Georges Bataille, mm -hmm. the big toe. And of course, in his uh, article uh, on the big toe, he says not just that this is phallic, the, the big toe, but also it's touching the ground. Yeah. And that is, of course, the dirty part. Yeah. It's like spit, slime, all that kind of stuff the surrealists are crazy about. Yes, it is formless. <laughs> it's, it's the inform, yeah, it's the formless stuff. And the, the surrealists try to make that very strong. And if we watch this here now, we see the taste of the upper class and we have the gardening, yeah. it's very Go strict, it's, yeah. it's very strict. And what we really don't see, and you mentioned that in your lecture, and that's basically my question is, mm. we don't see real excess, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, so, we don't see a transgression of taboos or laws, which is usually the kind of thing that happens in surrealist films or in early Buñuel. Oh. What, what about the sex in the garden? Oh, please. <laughs> please. No, no. Is that so unusual for you, Daniel? <laughs> no. <laughs> With <Really>. lush dog. <laughs> That's it's not nothing. so unusual. <laughs> if really that is transgression, nothing. I don't know. Okay, maybe I'm more conservative <laughs> uh, in my views. Okay, but anyway. Um, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I think the, the adjective discreet 
is uh, exactly what I yeah uh, what I wanted to to say that is um, is hide this excess this excess this violence is extremely violent to what they did in uh, in this film the the deal of the cocaine the drug uh, and the, but we but everything is discreet what's, what's so violent but about drugs I mean violent in this sense is very is they are corrupt they are yes. the, yeah they, they a racket they, uh, they, they, they form a racket they, yeah. they're mafia okay? mafia yeah so, so that's a that's the usual bourgeois attitude this yeah. is how how we are ruled and so yeah. on including the state the the military the police and, and yeah, yeah. clergy and all that kind of stuff yeah, yeah. so I, I don't I'm, I'm not so sure still about the transgression here I mean mm -hmm. they show us how, they, how are. they are organized basically yeah 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 and as you mentioned in your lecture you know i mean having this you know rituals of how you take in food this is how you form your identity how you put down other people uh, mm. uneducated as they are called yeah, yeah. people and so on so uh, this is the normal kind of we know that this is happening mm -hmm. so this is not really a transgression it's no. it's just showing basically the truth what they are yeah they, they're, 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 they're basically are. naked and mm -hmm. of course, he can't show them naked. Yeah, he has to show them well dressed, yeah. garderobe and all, all kind, haute couture, all that kind of stuff. This is what haute you need. Cuisine, haute cuisine, haute couture, haute couture, couture yeah. all that kind of stuff. So, this is culture. This is why you have a gardener. You yeah. destroy nature. So, so destruction is, as you know, a, a very important issue in modernity. Yeah, but uh, it's hide in the in this. Um, Tableau uh, bourgeois. Donc, uh, they we don't see this this distraction, but there is inside the the, the, the body of the uh, bourgeois society. So my my question is, why Buñuel chose discreet in this film? For me, that is the key to understand the film because this this discreet. What is discreet? Because they are in all this corruption is invisible, because um, this discreet is something that uh, uh, we have we don't have to know, uh, like the minister of uh, interiority at the end of film, Michel Piccoli. Huh? No, we can't see and uh, we can listen this corruption, violence, and uh, everything. Yes, destruction of nature and uh, uh, what else? Then we is invisible, indeterminate, invisible. So I think the key is to answer what is discreet for Bonuel in this film. Sorry, just, just one last mention. Uh, but you were also already hinting at Don Juan, at theater, which usually works very some in a very symbolic way mm -hmm. whereas film especially surrealist film is like showing naked truth yeah not so symbolic <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah okay so uh it's indiscreet film is as you said indiscreet yeah, yeah. whereas theater is discreet symbolic and in that way you can show structures uh, orders functionings functioning. mechanisms don juan this is a uh, this art, this is the sex machine yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And this is, of course, what, what is criticized also in surrealism, yeah, even yeah. if they don't admit it. They, they're very, they have a morale, and the morale is not so much the uh, uh, machine kind of thing. The transgression mm -hmm. is not what a machine does. A machine follows rules, yeah, sure. whereas the human being, life, we, the unconscious, we, if we do the transgressions, we're not a machine. Yeah, yeah. Completely the opposite. And, and so? yeah, so so the discrete kind of stuff you can only do uh, and on, on the theater stage, not in film. Mm -hmm. it, it 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 feels unrealistic to to use uh, to use Buñuel terms. He has to make it real, he said, or realistic. Yeah, but I think the uh, because you mentioned the big thaw and then the the Buñuels of the late twenties. I think that the the the, com the comparison between the L'Age d'Or or uh, Un Chien Andalou, that is indiscreet in, the, in your yeah, 
uh, reading or point of view. And then in the late uh, 60 or 17, it becomes something discrete, but not. <laughs> uh, it's the same structure, I think. Yes, uh, 50 years later, and then society changed. Uh, oh, okay, but I think this is this change, this changing, or in the point of view of Bonuel, from the L'Age d'Or Archie Andalou and the Quel obscur objet du désir, Les Fantons de la Liberté, uh, and so on. This, this is the answer. Yeah. yeah, is this reflective also of his changed relationship with the audience yeah. and with the film industry? Sure. Large Door, famously, there were riots in the cinema. You know, the yeah. police came in, shut it down. Yeah, yeah. It was censored for a long time. But, uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, you mentioned Saad. Uh, this yeah, is present in Large Door. And, yeah, I totally agree with you in this film. But in a total different yeah. But oui, Le Chambre du Secret de la Bourgeoisie it was a popular success among the bourgeoisie. Mm. Uh, they were they liked watching this film. Uh, <laughs> it was rewarded by Hollywood, the yeah, yeah. you know the avatar of uh, mm. a, a, a kind of the bourgeois cinema, let's say, with the Oscar. Mm -hmm. um, so is he? Is this also for why I is he talking about himself here there, a little yeah. bit? His own discretion. Uh, the way he's adapting his cinema mm -hmm. to, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say that he's making a concession, but somehow he's changed mm -hmm. his strategy from the open provocation of the twenties mm -hmm. and thirties mm -hmm. to, to the a, a more subtle uh, way of skewering the, the his kind of political and uh, class, yeah. let's say, enemies, but also a kind of frère enemy in a way yeah. there's but a recognition I, of his own i don't know bourgeois kind yeah. of being in a sense the fact that he says it's no. his uh, recipe Maybe for a dry martini a, okay a uh, i would like uh, <laughs> to add something yeah. uh, what i what i found quite shocking about um the film. Uh, i think the the society the um that they uh, s seemed uh, couldn't be couldn't be to get shocked by anything at all mm -hmm. and maybe this will be my suggestion what is discrete and mm -hmm. and um uh, i think in in sense of um of a mystery mm -hmm. um it might be uh, that they survive only on their sufficiality because they are so sufficient they can all um they can uh, get along with everything um after a, a small irritation and it seems to be a joke and um, I felt a bit uh, uh, here in the, the audience too, there were some, uh, just the small people, which reacted uh, the same way, uh, which made uh, great fun of everything. Uh, there is a certain comic uh, in, yeah. in uh, the scenes, but I think um, it's quite bitter in in a hidden sense or um, mm -hmm. uh, if you think uh, secondly about this and yeah this was everything i want to add yeah hi um uh, do you have also a question or is a comments because i i yeah mm, maybe we can yeah a couple yeah yeah i can comics um, i don't know oh yeah i know for a while i kept on thinking and pondering about this film and <clears throat> trying to crack my brains over what I saw for, I guess, about an hour and a half or maybe two hours. <laughs> it really wasn't making a lot of sense until, you know, mm -hmm. I just realized, okay, so this film, okay, was made for a certain class of people, right? And um, the bourgeois, right? For people that have a lot of money and really don't know what to do with money, don't really don't know what to do with their time, right? So just having fun, doing stupid stuff. And I mean, sorry to use stupid as, you know, yeah, I mean, just to entertain a certain kind of class of people, you know, and I am not in that kind of class. So 
and that was why I wasn't getting it at all. You know, I was like, okay, what's the message? What is, I mean, what are they trying to portray here? And um, I guess the last, I mean, 10 minutes and everything just came up to me. as like, oh, great. Now I understand. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the last 10 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> now, now I understand. You know, this appeals to, you know, rich folks, you know, that have so much time to themselves and um, just want to do whatever they want to do just to have fun. And I guess that was what I got from this. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can continue with another comment or question from um, Lark. No, I'm. Um, I was thinking about because last last week we saw um, the exterminating angel, um, and I was yeah. thinking kind of um, perhaps a change of strategy on Benuel's part in criticizing uh, the bourgeoisie. And um, also connecting to what Daniel said, kind of that perhaps it's m more moves more towards kind of a self-criticism. Mm -hmm. kind of self Bunuel's. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Bunuel being kind of part of that class, but also um, tied to this um, discretion, like this term of discrete, um, and then also to this dream structure, which kind of displays a high level of mm -hmm. paranoia um, throughout the film. So. Yeah, maybe I'm I'm interested in in kind of his his transformation and strategy of critiquing the mm -hmm. bourgeoisie, which seems to indicate that perhaps yeah, this entire mm -hmm. um, existence kind of is is uh, marked by this constant uh, fear and paranoia, mm -hmm. of losing this superiority. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. That an interesting change in in uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, maybe uh, to res to summarize <laughs> everything, yeah. or if you want to say something about this, uh, I, I, uh, yeah. No, <laughs> I I think yes. The my question <laughs> to you, to the audience, is uh, what is the destiny of the bourgeoisie in this film? Because uh, is Buñuel criticize? everything or is something that is uh, remain <laughs> in the uh, in this class or is, um, is is showing something that is uh, at the end of his story of a history because this the last scene and the 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 walk the six people walking in the countryside, I think, is the maybe the key, <laughs> <laughs> the invisible key, or the uh, of the film because they are where they are going, they are going where. So f I think they are. Uh, we yeah. yeah. Sorry, no. I just tr uh, thought that uh, the bourgeoisie uh, will always exist yeah. because they are very much adaptable in every society. You will have. Uh, an upper class and um, money helps but um, what I thought is maybe this discretion is that um, Bunuel became also more accessible to uh, let's say a um, large audience, large, um, audience mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. former or the early movies of Bunuel are quite um, yeah I don't know if if they had really a large audience or let's say a more mainstream audience and I think yeah, yeah. through this um, with these Movies with also this um, I don't know the um, das Objekt uh, das uh, Objekt der Be das wie heißt der Film? Uh, obscure object obscure of design. Okay. yeah exactly this I mean with all these movies there I just have the feeling they're more accessible for and they're much closer for mm -hmm. mainstream which no, um, a lot of I guess also French or Spanish filmmakers mm -hmm. they had this early work and then they got more accessible to n to larger audience and I think that maybe this discretion yeah. is also to make it um, yeah for somebody who's not rich or can't, doesn't have mm -hmm. this lifestyle I guess um, you will shut down if you have this um, 
excess if you see these people kind of live out their excessive lives mm -hmm. with money because you immediately would say ah yeah i know this this is corrupt i don't have yeah. to see it anymore because it's something that you think why should i oh, yeah why should i watch that but <laughs> If he, he prolongs that every time that he shows sure. also that the bourgeoisie is kind of a uh, human they are the, the same than us but they just have more money more money and uh, they are maybe more visible I, I, yeah i totally agree uh, the, the the bourgeoisie is still alive <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> uh, but he i think bonuel uh, is it's trying to um, to explain to the his audience that bourgeoisie is changing is changing and uh, uh, he's in some way lost in the countryside uh, walking uh, that we but it's only changing but it's still it's there, it's sti it's still there. It's, sure, sure they can adjust better it's what i yeah said it, tried to yeah. say it in my lecture yeah. is this is my uh, proposal of uh, a reading of the of the film but it is uh, If in the in the late twenties the the bourgeoisie is maybe indiscreet huh? and uh, excessive in this eroticism or perverse practices, uh, etc., in Lashdar, uh, for example, it, uh, the bourgeoisie becomes discreet in this period because yeah, we we can't listen or see what they do, and then after he's changing again and maybe uh, the bourgeoisie becomes again indiscreet huh? don't think excessive uh, more money more correct uh, one more thought but that we had already i guess in this time for example yeah. in the end of the 90s when you see like in the real world yes for why i say very yes. excessive like people who were rich were really uh, like also uh, in times of tiktok or something I see how people are rich are the, but the real uh, rich people you I don't see anymore and in my i'm um, italian uh, and uh, in, in my country i saw this with berlusconi at the uh, late 80s 90s and uh, uh, it was a huge uh, Back yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I maybe I yes. I to we have a question here. Yeah, <coughs> um, I mean, uh, what you both of you said, I think, makes perfectly sense. And I especially have to think about the one scene where they are sitting on stage, mm -hmm. quite literally, mm -hmm. and it worked perfectly because we have red curtains as well, and yeah. it really felt like a yeah, subtle yeah, sure. <laughs> fourth wall breaking there. Uh -uh. And uh, but the um, theater was full with people I would more describe with like normal people, um, like uh, pleb people uh, yeah, criticizing the bourgeoisie. Even, I would even go so far as to say almost a mm -hmm. leftist audience. Yeah. Looked and like a young leftist kind mm -hmm. of crowd. Yeah, and in, in that context, it eye, makes least, yeah. perfectly <laughs> sense what you say yeah. as well, because uh, the bourgeoisie is falling apart in front of them, and they are quite literally disappearing from the stage, but yeah. they are not gone. They are just It's out of sight. But um, yeah, and maybe this was one of the only real scenes in terms of yeah. is it real or not, because um, when everything when there's no reality and everything is acting this was the absent of acting and um therefore maybe of course it just in the get a welt um the only energetic world yeah <laughs> the absence of acting it was acting nonetheless but i get Then i think you know what i mean <laughs> you you mean that this uh the sequence of acting in the in the stage is realistic because They reveals the the mechanism of the acting of the the representation uh, of the uh, of this class or yeah and they're forgetting their yeah. text and all that stuff yeah yeah it was uh, my uh, favorite even if a dream even yeah. if it's a dream yeah <laughs> the dream is more realistic than all the scene that we see at the here at the at the incipit or at the beginning because yes it's um it's like It's a good point, yeah. <laughs> All right, we've got five more minutes before yeah. we uh, wrap up. Last comment or maybe... If I could... Oh, well, there's I a question up here. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it's not a question, it's just an addition. Yeah. I feel that uh, Bunuel is right, the bourgeoisies are always discreet. Um, why am I saying this? Because... 
for um, for very many years uh, especially let me i use my context uh, is my is more i'm more balanced in my context it takes uh, the fella i don't know if you if you heard about the fella music this this uh, mm-hmm. afro beat uh, singer in africa or nigeria in particular they call him fella like uh, it takes him to sing uh, a, a particular song called ITT 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 yeah the ITT it means international thief thief so i the international then thief thief for us to understand basically that oh these are the bourgeois class they you that really are existing I don't know but uh, I find it very interesting because my hundred level and first year in university that was when we realized that oh these are the real bourgeois class that we're talking about so they are really discreet you will never know until date around Africa and in Nigeria huh? you don't say oh these are the bourgeois class I Daniel Fairfax were in class yesterday with him and I said look uh-huh. within the context of this particular film I take myself as the bourgeois class and he said oh you are the bourgeois I said no I said within this particular context so It's really discreet. <laughs> it depends on, <laughs> on the application of it. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Was, uh, which we context? A, we had a class because discussion. Because I missed something, I think. Uh, yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> It's a student. It's a student. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm not sure if it's already been mentioned, but what really stood out to me during the film was I felt like it's um, going in circles mm-hmm. all the time. And I was wondering if it's on purpose or if the circle at some point gets broken and mm-hmm. I did not realize. But Mm-mm. what I took out of it is like the bourgeois class does not really develop in time. Mm-hmm. It stays always the same because of its power. They have money and mm. I don't really think it's about being discreet or not because mm-hmm. we're talking about this like it's something really important but i felt it's more important to understand that the circle mm-hmm. is going on and it doesn't really matter if you go 100 years back or maybe 100 years in the future yeah. it really stood out to me and those dreaming sequences really kind of underlie or I put emphasizes on it what do you say uh, it's a very good point because i never thought about it but um yes i think the circle uh, is the If you want, is the sy- the symbol of the the bond, the social bond in the for the bourgeoisie. Then, if you uh, remember the last sequence, the the walking, they are not in circle, but they are in a line. So I think that's another element that uh, confirms that the bourgeoisie is lost. The lost is th- this this bourgeois represented it in film not the bourgeoisie uh, like a class because yes we <laughs> it's still alive <laughs> but i think this the if circle and line is uh, yeah mm, something that we have to to mention and to analyze this sort of uh, they are lost and they are not in the same Uh, they're going in a line. Disposition. But there's no sense that they're getting anywhere. Line, yeah. Stay, even it's, it's, it yeah. almost seems like they're just but, yeah. not um, progressing. But yeah. I wanted to just in our last few minutes uh, bring up something that well, I felt was uh, uh, like in in a sense pierced mm-hmm. the, the veil of the film as well, which are the moments of what we could call a kind of political reality mm-hmm. uh, that emerged. There's the <laughs> the the left wing terrorism. Ah, uh, yeah. that we see in the film uh That's the and then the torturing mm-hmm. uh of the young dissident yeah yeah um and in some sense i think from a, f- we look back the at the Maoist film now, one uh, of me from miranda or uh, uh or the Marseille no later the, the guy the, the young guy who's tortured and ah okay okay the at piano the end. yeah like yeah the electroshock yeah yeah uh, torture um But, uh, I mean, this is something we didn't think, oh, it's the 70s. That was just the, the yeah. aura of the time. But mm-hmm. this is 1972. Uh, that's actually kind of before you have the Red Brigades or the Rota Army. Yeah, I see. Uh, yeah. It's before you sure. have also the dictatorships in Chile and Argentina <laughs> where the, like torture yeah, actually becomes yeah. part of the kind of um, ruling strategy. So in some ways this film is... Uh, 
a prediction of what's happening, what's going to happen later yeah, in the yeah, 70s. Yeah, in a way, there's thing, a kind of uncanny yeah. quality to how Buñuel is foreseeing like the political yeah. events that will emerge in the years to come. But um, I don't know if Buñuel thinks that the terrorism is the only way to distract the bourgeoisie, maybe. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure because the yeah the I don't necessarily are think he's dream, advocating terrorism. Are in a dream. Uh, yeah. But uh, I don't think he's advocating terrorism, but it is because a moment where let's say the facade of the bourgeoisie falls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, yeah. And uh it, it is the moment it is it is the moment where there is the reversion to naked violence I, on I the part of the bourgeoisie against any perceived threat to their well, continued rule. We have just... Uh, and the, the, the bourgeois manners go out the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's naked. They are not yeah, mm. in the circle, united. In, uh, yeah. And I, I think for... Uh, but the, the film is um, uh, ni um, 1972. And uh, the key moment of the terrorism, uh, once again, in Italy... But is the brigade uh, red brigade in uh, about the case of Aldo Moro? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. seventy eight? Is, yeah, exactly. And it's years later. Six year before yeah. this, so I I think yes, is a sort of uh, preconization of this uh, this moment. But even in Italy, even with the red brigade, even with the the case of the uh, the murder of uh, Aldo Moro. Uh, nothing is, uh, <laughs> nothing is, uh, everything is the same mm -hmm. in the, uh, the yeah. reality in Italy is the same. But the bourgeoisie is changed after this episode. And, uh, <laughs> and then I think this is the passage from the discreet to indiscreet. But uh, yeah, the facade of the bourgeoisie maybe yes is a uh, fall down, but uh, nothing more, I think. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Yeah. History. <laughs> yeah, history. But, but it also shows, I mean, this is something where in 1972, mm -hmm. you could possibly posit the imminent demise of the bourgeoisie, mm. uh, but it's precisely this kind of uh, reversion to violence that yeah. ensured its continued but, existence but up to the present day, alas. To conclude, <laughs> but Bonuel, for, for you, Bonuel, where is it about this constellation? Is uh, is near as close uh, to this uh, position, political political position of the yeah brigade rouge or terrorist, or is no, I don't ironically I don't, I, vision I, I of as a yeah. sort of yeah. I don't think there's a faith that that's somehow the correct path forward. Uh, mm. I think there's a kind of uh, certainly a, a deg great degree of distance between Buñuel and the, yeah. the, this kind of left-wing terrorist. Uh, perhaps a kind of the uh, a respect for their youthful enthusiasm uh, that might re have reminded him of his own provocative youth in the yeah. 1920s, albeit uh, in yeah. the sphere of art rather than yeah. uh, politics. Because yeah, yeah, I think he. Uh, He's an anarchist, Buñuel, mm -hmm. so uh, it's very, very difficult to 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 yes, to identify his position, uh, political position from the twenties. I studied a lot uh, his, uh, yeah. um, this period, twenties and thirties, uh, in his films and his uh, yeah, biography, and he's. Uh, is not communist, is not uh, uh, bourgeois, is, 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 is over, is, is a real, uh, I think is, a, is an anarchist. And then so uh, it explains uh, many things in these films because he, there is, he is not represented by the characters in this film. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but... <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> well, maybe we have to leave it there. Uh, we could go on all night, but we should probably More let people go <laughs> home. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but thanks once again uh, to Marie. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and discussion. Uh, and we'll see each other all again in three weeks' time. Uh, for uh, Tristana. No. For Tristana, yes. Oh, wow. 40 Shifra. No. So uh, <laughs> see you then. Okay, bye. Good night. Good night.